When did people first move to live in the different regions of the remote Pacific Islands? And then how did those parameters affect the possibilities for additional long-distance voyaging and cross-regional contacts through time? Archaeology has provided relevant information about these issues of ancient migrations, seafaring, and mobility across the Pacific Oceanic region. This video offers a brief summary. The archaeological record has shown how people in the past had explored and voyaged across the ocean in several incremental steps, generally moving from the west to the east. Historical linguistics studies independently have defined the same chronological order of events. Furthermore, studies of skeletal remains and of modern DNA have corroborated the same outline, and limited amounts of ancient DNA studies now are adding yet another line of independent verification. Archaeology works with definite physical evidence in specific places and time periods. The results at a large scale depict where people lived during separate time periods. When these time periods are arranged in their natural chronological order, then the chronological narrative shows how people in the past inhabited an ever-growing range and a diversity of the Pacific throughout the last thousands of years. Within each snapshot of time, this record shows where people lived and the potential scope of how they could have been in contact with each other. Additionally, the physical evidence shows the kinds of pottery and other artifacts that people made, the kinds of houses where they lived, and the kinds of foods that they ate. Some of these attributes were distinctive of individual places and time periods, and potentially some attributes could reveal connections between one community and another in different geographic locations. By 50,000 years ago, people already had been living throughout East Asia and into the ancient land masses of Southeast Asia and as far as the ancient continents and land masses of Australia and New Guinea. During the last major ice age, when sea level was much lower than at present, this entire region was connected by continental shelves and short distances of water crossings that later became flooded and submerged deep beneath the modern-day ocean. During those ancient conditions of the Ice Age, however, various plants and animals spread across this region. Homo erectus and other ancient hominid ancestors lived here as well. The record of our modern species, Homo sapiens, began here at least 50,000 years ago. Outside this ancient inhabited Ice Age region of the world, the remote distance Pacific Islands were disconnected from the larger continents and land masses. Voyaging to these remote distance islands would have involved at least 350 kilometers of ocean travel, and at least some portion of this voyage brought people beyond the sight of land in any direction of view. Within the range of the continental shelves and short distance water crossings, people lived primarily as hunter-gatherers, fishers, and foragers. The site records are known mostly through cave shelter camps and a few rare cases of open area camps, where the major artifacts, or often the only artifacts, included different types of stone tools. Even long after the end of the last major ice age, people continued to live as hunter-gatherers and with various stone tool technologies. Much later, an abrupt new horizon appeared in the archaeological layers, revealing the first ever occurrence of earthenware pottery in the region. This pottery-bearing horizon had started in mainland East Asia many thousands of years earlier, but it extended across to Taiwan after about 2800 BC and then underwent a series of developments there, locally within Taiwan. By 2200 BC, the pottery traditions in Taiwan had changed to produce new variations of red-slipped pottery and other output. These traditions then started to be produced not only in Taiwan, but also in a few sites near the northern edge of island Southeast Asia, around 2200 BC through perhaps 2000 BC. In this case, the long-distance geographic expansion of the pottery tradition reflected the movement of people and the expansion of populations across the ocean. A few centuries later, within this northern area of island Southeast Asia, the pottery traditions again underwent some change. Around 1800 BC, or perhaps slightly later, a unique new development only in this area involved 
finely decorated versions of the red slips pottery, including circle stamping, dentate stamping, and fine line incisions, often highlighted by white lime infilling. The next major change occurred around 1500 BC. By this time, the generic red slips pottery tradition has spread into more areas of island Southeast Asia, but the distinctive finely decorated pottery remained restricted to the northern areas. Additionally, around 1500 BC, the distinctive decorated red slip pottery appeared for the first time ever in the remote distance islands of Pacific Oceania, when people created several residential habitation sites in the Mariana Islands. So far, at least eight of these ancient habitations have been verified in three separate islands of the Marianas, where the material contents included the diagnostic pottery, diverse stone and shell artifacts, dense food middens, traces of ritual cave venues, and the remnants of ancient house structures. About 150 years later, around 1350 BC, the pottery bearing horizon expanded out eastward into the islands east of New Guinea, such as in the Bismarck Archipelago. These sites are well known as the oldest places with the Lapita pottery style. Using the distinctive dentate stamping and other techniques that already had been developed elsewhere, but then were applied in more elaborate and lavish artistic designs, including a human face motif, among other output. During the period from about 1100 BC through 800 BC, the Lapita pottery tradition expanded into a larger geographic area, including the movement of people living for the first time in the remote distance islands of southern Melanesia and West Polynesia, specifically in places of New Caledonia, Vanuatu, Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa. Meanwhile, some plain pottery traditions started to appear in a few parts of New Guinea. Additionally, at this time, people started living in Palau of Western Micronesia, where they produced a different style of plain pottery. A major environmental change occurred around AD 100 through 200, when the worldwide sea level started to stabilize near its current level. During the preceding few thousands of years, the sea level had been slightly higher, and then it lowered just enough to make the low-lying atolls of Micronesia inhabitable for the first time. The sea level lowered enough to expose inhabitable land surfaces of the atolls, as well as to allow the freshwater lens to float above sea level at a position that people could access, and that could support healthy plant growth, including essential tree and root crops. This period around AD 100 through 200 coincided with the widespread inhabitation of the atolls of Micronesia and a few of the remaining higher islands that were not yet inhabited previously, in total representing a large-scale growth of the inhabited Pacific Oceanic world. The next large-scale expansion occurred some centuries later, around AD 1000, when people moved much farther eastwards to inhabit the farther areas of East Polynesia. The final parts of this expansion moved as far southward as New Zealand around AD 1300. The expansion beginning around AD 1000 coincided with a region-wide change in the archaeological record. After this time, the archaeological records in every part of the Pacific Islands included more formalized stonework houses, villages, and monuments, as well as traditions of burying people at those stonework houses or monuments. The particular designs of stonework sites were different for each island group, yet they all signified a change toward more formalized connections between groups of people and the specific lands or territories where they lived. This later period, after AD 1000, involved the full extent of people inhabiting all parts of Pacific Oceania. In this scenario, the opportunities were the most numerous and the most diverse for the different island communities to be in contact with each other. In the complete chronological order of the evidence, several time periods show the incremental growth or expansion of where people live through time. At each successive point of the chronological narrative, people inhabited a larger and more diverse geographic range of the Asia-Pacific region. Along with each geographic growth or expansion, at least some people engaged in continuing long-distance contacts with people living in the other inhabited areas. Within this basic outline of the evidence, considerable more details are known about the artifacts and findings from each site of every island group and time period. For now, 
I hope for this basic outline to establish the factual parameters for thinking about archaeology and ancient history of the region. Whatever specific issue may be of interest, this initial chronological narrative can help to frame the boundaries of what is even possible, and then the finer details can be considered within the scope of any particular topic, geographic area, and time period. Based on this chronological narrative, what questions are interesting for you, and how would you approach finding the answers to your questions? Thank you for watching here. I will see you in the next video.